Welcome back to LA Catholic Morning here on Archangel Radio. I'm Todd Sylvester here with Michelle McAloon, my great set at the Command Center. On the line, we have regular guest Duncan Stroick, who is a professor of architecture at the University of Notre Dame, here to continue with our series looking at many of the cathedrals in the United States. And I guess, Duncan, it makes sense to start with the Basilica of the Assumption in Baltimore, since that was the very first, correct? Yes, it's the first cathedral in the what well, was the 13 colonies and then, and then became the uh, uh, eventually the United States. Which is amazing to me because I'm looking at it, and I know, I guess, in some standards it would be considered smaller, but back then this thing must have been huge. It really was. Uh, if you can think back to the colonies and uh, what we considered a big city and uh, Washington, D.C. is just starting to be planned out. There really are very few buildings there. Um, before the War of 1812, there's just not, uh, uh, this was a very large building. Today, it's not. Today, uh, probably it holds 600 people. That's not a lot for a church in America. But uh, this was a country um, with uh, a, a lot of smaller churches, and, and certainly Catholic churches. This was the largest at the time. And it had towers and a dome and a portico with ionic columns. So it had a lot. Uh, a lot of grand architecture, too. See, all, all of that kind of stuff is always fascinating to me, Duncan, because I am not an artist, and I know I'm never going to be called to be an, an architect with the, that kind of design, but I'm a builder. And I get in, and I start mm. looking at the structure, and I start going, well, how did they do that? Like, this scaffolding must have been huge, you know, to think, and all of that stuff they had to kind of make, because w- what year did they start on this? So the design starts about 1806, and I think it finishes somewhere around 1821. And, of course, all buildings have a client and an architect. All great buildings have a client and an architect. The client here, John Carroll, the first bishop in the U.S., uh, actually died before it was complete. Mm. Uh, so you're right. It's, uh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, I do things like this today, but we have lots of technology to help us. And in those days, they had very fancy weights and pulleys and uh, men with big biceps and animals <laughs> to move stone and, and materials. Wow. When this was first built, where, what was the locale around it? Was the, the city of Baltimore, was it a, a nascent city kind of, actually it wasn't, it was probably one of, it was probably what, a hundred years old by that time, but was it in the middle of a city setting or was this a country thing or how was it? What, what, did it, what was the environment when it was originally designed? Yes, that's a great question um, and a good point because cathedrals being the mother church of the diocese, and in this case, <laughs> originally it was the mother church for the whole, the whole uh, United States, um, it needs to be in a prominent place. And Washington is not really a city yet. It's just beginning. Um, so, and, and Maryland is a very Catholic state. It was one of the states that was the, uh, the give, gave the most freedom to Roman Catholics. And so they had been there in larger numbers. In fact, my own family, my, my own Irish family, uh, the Dorseys were, uh, settled in old Bohemia in, uh, near the Eastern shore. But anyway, Maryland was a very Catholic town. So, um, uh, and Baltimore was a Catholic town. And so, yeah, it's in the city, it's prominent, it's on a square. That's the other thing uh, we think of in southern Catholic countries, piazzas or plazas in maybe more English places. We have a green, but some kind of a public space around it for a prominent building. You give it space for gathering, for setting it off so you can see it, um, as Alberti says, as a freestanding temple. Uh, so you're right. The, the placement is very important. It's slightly on a hill in Baltimore. It's above the wharf, above the port. And uh, it's uh, at that time, it would have been able to be seen from a large area of Baltimore. Today, it's surrounded by decent sized buildings. Uh, so it's still prominent, but not so much from afar. It's not something on the skyline. Um, and that's the case of many of our great cathedrals in this country because we build big, big buildings. So architecturally, to talk to us about this basilica because you already mentioned things 
like the dome and the and the towers. So was that unusual at that time? I think the um, the dome is uh, fairly unusual. It's not the first dome in the U.S., um, but it may be one of the earliest on a church. And what's interesting is Latrobe, who we think of as being a friend of Jefferson, and they um, they discussed architecture and debated architecture quite a bit. Um, also used domes. Um, Latrobe himself. Uh, promoted domes in a lot of his work, and he was very interested in masonry domes. Um, he was uh, the second or third architect at the U.S. Capitol and proposed a dome, and it wasn't built. He also worked on the uh, White House. Um, but interestingly, according to John Waite, who restored the Baltimore Cathedral, the domes at the U.S. Capitol that Latrobe built leaked. They huh. had they had uh, glass uh, oculi right at the top. The, the the opening, the skylight at the top was glass, and they they got a lot of water in there. So uh, he and Jefferson were talking, and he came up with this other solution here, where the ceiling actually has skylights, a series of skylights, and um, there's actually a painting in the middle, and the light comes in kind of mysteriously. Uh, from above. You don't look straight up like in the Pantheon. But the point is, your point is right. This is a building about domes. Today, there are three domes, uh, two little domes and one big dome over the crossing, over the the middle of the cross. And then the apse itself is semicircular, so it's a half dome. And again, this is the this is the beginning of domical architecture, or not the beginning, but it's one of the important moments of domical architecture, which became so important in the nation's capital, but it really crossed the country uh, to the use of the ancient Roman dome or other kinds of domes as well. Duncan, explain that term that you used, the apps, for our listeners so they know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. So the apse is the semicircular shape uh, at the end of a nave, at the end of a church, usually, and it's concave. And we see it in ancient Roman architecture. And particularly, we see it in the ancient Roman early Christian churches. And they have a simple colonnaded nave and then the apse. And the apse was the place of importance. And you have a half dome and you have a curved wall. And you have the bishop seated on his throne, the cathedra in the apse right on center. And then in front of him, uh, probably blocking him, would be uh, the altar, probably covered with a canopy with four columns. And um, so the apse is an ancient way to give focus. You know, you put, a, you put a curved element at the end of your room, you put a half dome at the end of your room, and then you put the important things there, the altar, um, the, uh, the gold, the, the, the statues, the angels, the bishops thrown there. So it's a place of focus. Okay. I, I'm always fascinated by this, Duncan. Like I mentioned before, you know, because I look at those domes and I think, man, that, you know, as you're building that up and until you get that top kind of capped stone to structurally give it strength, I, I would be so concerned about that thing collapsing <laughs> as it's going up, trying yes. to be supported. And, and I'm, I'm picturing again all of the things that they had to do to get that together. It, it's just amazing that they had that forethought. Yes, um, Todd, that's a really good point. And there have been actually a couple of recent books on the challenges of building a dome. The most recent is a book about Michelangelo and Michelangelo as God's architect. And it talks about him building the Dome of St. Peter's. And as we know, Michelangelo was from Florence and, and all the challenges of St. Peter's and this huge dome, 140 foot in diameter and 300 something feet tall and but he was from Florence and so he learned among other things he learned from that first great dome in Florence which was done 100 100 uh, 100 years before him at the uh, cathedral the duomo the cathedral of Florence by Brunelleschi and there's a great book on that one called Brunelleschi's dome both of these books are written for the layperson. They're written, they explain how these things were built, 
the scaffolding, you're right. And if you're going to have a, a room that's that wide and you're 140 feet and you're, you know, let's say the dome begins 140 feet off the ground, how do you get scaffolding all that? That's lots, a lot of wood, mm -hmm. a lot of timber. Man. And so Brunelleschi figured out a way to do cantilevers, to do kind of um, triangular, you know, cantilevered floors with bracing. Okay, so now what's a cantilever? get out there to build that dome. What's a cantilever? A cantilever, something that's projecting like a beam, like sticking out. Okay. And supporting that with like a like an angle. So it's like a big angle. Instead of trying to build up from the floor, you know, 140 feet of wood scaffolding, they tried to build right out of the brick walls as they went up. And that's what Brunelleschi did in the for, mid-1400s. And then Michelangelo uh, developed that idea in building, you could say, the even grander but similar dome in uh, in St. Peter's. That is awesome. Can you imagine how scary that was without yes. OSHA? Yes, oh my I gosh, can. without OSHA. Okay, we are speaking with Doug Duncan Stroik on the Basilica of the Assumption in Baltimore, Maryland. It was America's first cathedral. And if you want to take a look at this, go to America's First cathedral.org and there's a beautiful kind of you can almost just walk virtual through tour, yeah, yeah virtual tour now tell us a little bit about the paintings in this cathedral when it was first made is this what the inside of the cathedral looked like or has it been refurbished or a little bit about the artwork inside of it okay that's good and i don't claim to be an expert at the artwork at this okay. building <laughs> but this is very interesting no, this is. I I, I think the, the the point is well taken because artwork is so crucial. Imagery um, icons are a window to the divine. So, but what's interesting about this cathedral is, um, it's the oldest cathedral. So, did they ever renovate it? Of course. Did they ever um, change uh, colors and uh, art and decoration? And did they ever add on to it? Yeah. I mean, a lot happened over the century and a half, two centuries now, that the uh, Baltimore Cathedral's been around. And so what's interesting is that the most recent uh, restoration was about 20 years ago under Cardinal Keeler, Archbishop of, of Baltimore, and uh, John Waite, architect in New York State, a uh, friend of mine. And uh, their goal was actually to return the cathedral to what it was intended to be originally. So they, the building had gotten a little bigger. They didn't take that off. Uh, the portico, the front columns had been added a little later, but they didn't take those off. These things all fit with Latrobe and Carroll's vision, the architect Latrobe and Carroll, uh, Bishop Carroll. So they, they continued with the development. It wasn't that, but they took some of the things out that they felt would not have fit. So this is shocking to many people today, but the, uh, they took out the stained glass. The stained glass was never there until the 1940s. Hmm. So oh, from 1820 to 1940, this had clear windows like a lot of American churches, like a lot of, you could say, um, yeah, like a lot of American Protestant churches. It had clear glass. Also, like a lot of Roman churches, a lot of Italian churches, um, it did not have uh, stained glass. And so a lot of light comes in, and there was a, a, a palette of colors, which I think of as kind of a cream and a slight yellow, mm -hmm. and then some moments of color blues and golds and reds that are in the coffers in the octagonal, in, in little parts of the interior. So it's a fairly, um, uh, the colors are simple on the inside, like a Roman church and like the exterior, but then you have these moments of color like around the dome, we think of under the dome, you know, you often under the dome, you'll have four, uh, four corners of the dome. And of course, uh, we think of, you know, if you're going to put four uh, images or four saints there, who do you put? The big ones, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yeah. Mary, Joseph, you get know, off those. Yeah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the tradition. Uh, it's not required, <laughs> but it is the tradition. So you have that. And uh, simple images of them. Uh, you have a number of statues of different saints, um, St. Michael and Our Lady, uh, on side altars, each with their own side altar and tabernacle. And uh, you have uh, some beautiful stations. Um, so, and, and then the ceiling. It's interesting. The ceilings 
um, have been repainted by Evergreen, very fine company in uh, New York City, who did the painted restoration. So you take out the stained glass, you change the colors back, you redo the pews the way they were originally, you rebuild the bishop's throne into a circular canopy, which is really lovely. It looks very colonial, uh, but it's the early throne with fabric coming down. And then you balance that out with the pulpit or the ambo, which is also uh, circular. And so you do all these things. You bring these things back um, to the church that had been, you know, developed and changed over the years. Some for good reason. Some maybe, you know, maybe they're mistakes. But anyway, that was the goal to bring it back. And uh, uh, but the ceiling paintings, uh, those are all new. So you have an image of the Assumption, and uh, on the ceiling, on these three domes, you have uh, uh, mainly on the two little domes. You have an assumption, you have an image of Christ on the other, and that's uh, by Evergreen. Wow, and that's still, that's still a living art, so people still know how to do that, correct? Yeah, and, you know, that's a good point. I really think that we need to, um, as Catholics, we need to uh, support the arts and support architects and craftsmen, as Todd was saying, the bricklayer, the dome builder. We need to support all these uh, great things, and... It's great to conserve and reuse because we have great, you know, we have wonderful tradition, but we need to, we need to uh, be patrons of new art, and they did that here in Baltimore. Very good. Duncan Stroick, thank you so much. And folks, go visit this cathedral, America First, americasfirstcathedral.org. Maybe you might want to take a road trip, and we will speak to you next week. Duncan, have a great week. Looking forward to it. Okay, bye bye. God bless. All right. And up next, we have Father Dave Carucci with his gospel reflection on LA Catholic Morning. Home is where the heart is, and my heart lives by the bay. Home is where.